Light is the hope to all who seek. Light is the way when moments are bleak. So look up to the skies. The light is Jesus Christ, and all who seek will find. Na 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 na. Hello friends, welcome to another episode of our wisdom series, Lucius Sicut Luminare, Shine Like a Star. I am Father Nelson Sequeira and the topic I'm going to deal with today is Law, Life and Love. The word law sounds intimidating. In normal circumstances, the mention of law brings to mind a restriction, a burden or an obstacle to living one's life freely. However, when a person is aggrieved over someone's action or because of a denial of a right, one seeks refuge in the law. In science, we come across laws like Newton's law of motion, Pascal's law of transmission of pressure, and others. We see in these scientific laws that nature follows a certain inbuilt principles and acts in a certain way. That disciplined conduct of nature benefits humanity. Nature is guided by laws, and knowing this fact, we feel secure. Example. We plan the time to sow, the time to harvest. For the progress of humanity, there is need that every individual follows certain principles. There are natural laws, and there are also other laws made by those who have been given authority. St. Thomas Aquinas defines law as an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. All that can contribute to the community's well-being in a human way is important. The importance of law sprouts from the well-being of humanity. No human community can remain in existence without laws. Laws coordinate the activity of members and the working of various dynamic forces. In this session, I will be speaking about the law in the Bible, how it came about in the church, the relationship of law, love and justice, and its application in community life. Law in the Bible. Looking at sacred scripture, there is a temptation to think that Jesus was against the law. Nevertheless, did Jesus really speak against the law? Jesus' attitude towards the teachers of law seems rather hostile. Let us have a look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 27, where we find Jesus stating, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 11 mentions Jesus placing before the Pharisees this question. Which one of you who has a sheep, if he falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? When the rich young man came to Jesus, asking what he should do to attain eternal life, Jesus' first response is to follow the commandments. Matthew, Mark and Luke mention this in the Gospels. Mark adds that when the young man replied that he had been keeping the commandments, Jesus looked at him and loved him and then gave him the advice of surrendering all his goods and serving the poor. Matthew mentions that Jesus came not to abolish the law, 
but to fulfill it. Jesus illustrated how the law is to be applied to everyday life based on two simple principles, the love of God and love of humanity. Love of humanity includes love of self, love of the other. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law considered the law as words and rules. But Jesus inserts a behavior required in a person. The human person and his or her needs took precedence of a ceremonial law. Following the law for the sake of law is called legalism. It is this legalism which Jesus wanted to do away with. The rule of the Sabbath was made so that it would benefit the hard-working person to gain rest and remind him or her of the master who is God. It would be worth now to look at why God gave a law to the people of Israel. The Bible gives us four reasons that God gave the Mosaic law to his people. One, for the good of the people. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 13, it says, God says, I am commanding you for your good. The law was given so that they would attain the goal to reach the promised land. Two, God wanted to reveal himself to them. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 11 verses 19 and 20, it is found that God says that he will give the people a new spirit and give them a heart of flesh and they will walk in his statutes and keep his rules and obey them and they would be his people and he would be their God. Third, God intended to set them apart in order to reveal himself to others. Again, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 28, verses 1, 9 and 10, it speaks of God setting apart the people of Israel as people holy to himself, that by seeing them obeying the commandments, the people will recognize that they are called by the Lord. Fourth, to know what is right and what is wrong and realize the need of a savior. Paul writing to the Romans says that had there not been a law, we would not have known sin. While one acknowledges what is good, one's weakness leads to commit evil. There comes the need of a savior and a forgiver. We can see that in giving the law, God wanted to have a special relationship with the people and wanted them to reciprocate through a behavior worthy of that relationship. Jesus came to build this relationship, which is love. The first three of the Ten Commandments are related to a relationship of life with God. And the other seven are related to a relationship with humanity. One needs to have a relationship of love with God as well as neighbor. Law in the church. When we look for the precise role of law in the Christian community, canon law and liturgical law come into focus. Any discourse on law concerns humanity and any discourse on law in the church is a discourse on humanity of the church says Ladislas Orsi, Professor Emeritus at Georgetown Uni University in Washington, D.C. Right from the apostolic times, the church felt the need of making laws. The question, whether the Jewish law of circumcision needed to be followed, was discussed in the First Council of Jerusalem. Down the centuries, many councils and synods were convened. There were more, law, more laws. In the 12th century, 
Johannes Gration, a professor in the University of Bologna, brought out a concordance of these norms and they are called Gration's Decrees. This was the beginning of canon law being taught as a separate discipline. The popes after the 12th century and the councils that followed gave more norms. So along with Gratian's decrees, there were another five books. All these five books were compiled into two volumes and collection came to be known as Corpus Juris Canonici, Body of Canon Law. But it does not end there. With the Reformation came more teachings and the most important milestone being the Council of Trent. Now, it was a problem for people to know the law. Has a particular law changed? Does it continue? Where do I find what is to be followed? It was a chaos. In the year 1904, Pope Pius X called for a code of canon law. He did not live to see it, but his successor, Pope Benedict XV, gave us the Code of Law in the year 1917. Law cannot remain static. It has to respond to situations. Hence, after the Second Vatican Council, it was revised and Pope John Paul II gave us the Code of Canon Law 1983 and the Code of Canons for Eastern Churches 1990. Law has to respond to particular local situations. That is why in our Archdiocese of Goa and Daman, besides the Code of Canon Law, we had a law that was applied to our diocese in 1953. In the year 2003, after the Synod, we have a particular law called Constitutions of the Archdiocese. Then we have Regulations of Fabrica's Coffres and Statutes of Confraternities. The life in the Church is based on faith, which is guided by theology. Our, our acts of worship, the liturgy, are based on theology. Theology and canon law are two distinct but harmonious disciplines and both aim for the building of, of the body of Christ. The primary source of theology is the words and deeds of God as revealed to us. The primary source of canon law is rules created by human agents who have been granted authority in the church, that is the bishops and the popes. The theologian discerns values for the Christian community based on revealed truths. The role of the canon lawyer is to create and interpret norms of action to help the Christian community attain the values identified by the theologians. The norms contained within canon law should be seen as only as one of the means to attain these values and should be changed when new means of or means better situated to the particular circumstances arise. That is why canon law states, salvation of souls is the supreme law. On the 29th of January 2019, Pope Francis speaking to the judges of the Roman Rota, which is the appellate court in the church, reminded that law is at the service of the salvation of souls. Canon law must depend on theology for its inspiration, while theology must look to canon law to expose concrete activities that enhance the life of the Christian community. In this regard, I would like to say something about penal laws. These are seen as punishment. Penal laws have a biblical basis. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, Jesus says, 
if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you a Gentile. The aim of penal laws, which we call sanctions in the church, is to help an errant person to recognize his or her fault and mend those ways. Canon law makes it clear that sanctions are to be used when all means to convince an errant person are exhausted. Penal laws are to be strictly interpreted and cannot be applied at the whims and fancies of the custodians and executors of the law. Law and love. Every human person has a desire to do good. And a person who believes in God would have a question. How do I please God? A person who believes in afterlife would ask, How do I attain eternal bliss? The rich young man came to Jesus and posed this question. Sacred scripture tells us that the law was given by God. St. Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 13, says, Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love, law, and life are interrelated. Hence, St. Augustine said, Love and do what thou wilt. In the sense, if one really loves, he or she will not do something that would harm another. It does not mean that love does away with the law. Dallin Harris Oaks, an American jurist, educator and religious leader says, the love of God does not supersede his laws and his commandments and the effect of God's laws and commandments does not diminish the purpose and effect of his love. Jesus therefore summarizes the law to love of God love of self and love of neighbor. Mahatma Gandhi said, love is a law of life. He further said, where there is love, there is life. In fact, law, love and life are interrelated. Law and life. Every person has a dignity of life and hence, he or she has rights. Naturally, as God's wonderful creation, one has a right to self-protection and sustenance. But these rights have limits. My right ends at the point where the right of another begins. St. John writes in his first letter, He who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. St. Francis of Assisi would then see the other as the whole creation. The, love, the law of love would therefore require me to give honour to God by protecting my own rights, the rights of other human persons, and the right to share in the wonder of creation. So to every right, there is a corresponding obligation. The law considers one's rights and free will not based merely upon individual autonomy but upon one's satisfaction of reaching out to others and being of service. It is therefore required that as much as I would like my rights to be respected, I have a duty to respect the rights of others. In the church, we would understand law as to be lived in communion. This was expressed by St. John Paul II while presenting the Code of Canon Law 1983. He stated that it is to be regarded as an indispensable instrument to ensure order, both in individual and social life, and also in the church's activity itself. Again, when he presented the law to the Eastern churches, he said he hoped 
that the code would happily be put into action of daily life. Law and community life. Communion exists first and foremost as a relationship with God. But as said earlier, referring to the letter of St. John, our relationship with God has to include our relationship with His creation, the community around us. The definition of law given by St. Thomas denotes that law is meant for common good. And the other aspect as an ordination of reason, that is, there must be a reason for every way of acting. It must be noted that every norm has to be linked to a value, whether human or divine. A value is that what promotes, supports or protects something that serves the welfare of the community. While the person lives in a community and has a social relationship, every person has a relationship to God at a personal level and also through the community. Thus, we have laws in the church for the proper conduct of liturgy, administration, judicial procedures, and even penal laws, which are called sanctions in the church. The law of the church is called canon law. It is meant to help the faithful to keep the unity of faith, the sacraments, and the relationship with the successors of the apostles, that is the Pope and the bishops. To conclude, laws are lampposts that guide us in the way of life and love. If the law does not help us to reach out in love, there is no sense in following it. The love of God invites us to obey His statutes in order to render to Him what is His due and acknowledge our need of Him. Law also helps us to love ourselves by exercising rights and duties. It helps us realize the limits of our rights by recognizing the rights of others around us and the community. Thus, it prevents from being selfish and also helps to keep a certain order in life. The rights of the community are protected because when we live the laws of love, we encourage others to live laws of life. In other words, when we truly love others without condition, without strings attached, we help them feel secure and safe and help them to recognize their essential worth, identity and integrity. Thus, we participate in God's plan for humanity. May God be praised by a life of love, by living His commandments and loving humanity.